Hello, everyone. My name is Colleen Vincent, Director of Culinary Community Initiatives for the James Beard Foundation. Oh. Welcome to COVID-19 and Communities of Color, hosted by Civil Eats. Um, how the webinars work today, uh, this webinar is being recorded and we'll send a link out after the program wraps. Please save your questions for the end, um, but please feel free to write your questions in the webinar toolbar. If you have technical dif difficulties, please also use the webinar toolbar and we'll do what we can to troubleshoot. So welcome um, to today's webinar hosted by Civil Eats. Today's moderator is Nadra Niddle of Civil Eats. Our guests today are Eric Adams, our Brooklyn Borough President, Daphne Altema Johnson from Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future, Glennon King from Augustine Monica Films, Kiana Mickey, speaker and a special consultant for Just Food, and our moderator, Nadra Niddle, who is a veteran journalist with a background reporting on a wide range of topics, including food, health, entertainment, religion, public policy, and consumerism. She is a senior reporter for Civil Eats and a regular contributor to NBC News, Think, KSET, Chronicle of Social Change, and Outreach Magazine. She's a former staff writer for Vox, the LA News Group, the USA Today Network, and her writing has appeared in The Guardian, Business Insider, Atlantic, and The New York Times. She has edited multiple book series for Enslow Publishing and has written the book Recognizing Microaggressions for that publisher. Today's webinar is based on her piece on COVID-19 and communities of color. And our panel of experts includes Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, who was elected to the first of four terms in the New York Senate in 2006. And during his tenure in the state legislature, chaired both the Veterans and Homeland Security and Military Affairs Committee, as well as the Racing, Gaming and Wagering Committee. In 2013, he was elected as the first person of color to serve as Brooklyn's borough president. He is currently serving his second time, second term as Brooklyn's chief executive. In 2016, he was diagnosed with type two diabetes and having lost vision in his left eye and suffering nerve damage, went against the recommendations of his doctors and pursued a whole food plant-based diet. He reversed his diagnosis and has subsequently been able to impact the health of countless New Yorkers facing chronic diseases, including his own mother. Our next guest, Daphne Altema Johnson, is from the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future. She joined the center in 2019 as program officer with Food Communities and Public Health, following a year-long dietetic internship that led to her becoming a registered dietitian and nutritionist. Before that, she was an epidemiologist and lead evaluator at the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in the Oral Health Department. She also served as chief evaluator for the HRSA Workforce Grant and CDC Cooperative Agreements Oral Health Grant. At the center, she uses her experience and expertise as a nutritionist to support the Meatless Mondays campaign. And she is especially interested in reaching young people with wellness messages through school programs and community outreach. Get them started early is her guiding principle. Our next guest is Clinton L. King, a critically acclaimed and award-winning documentary filmmaker whose films focus on the underrepresented experience of Africans in America, particularly when it concerns their history, struggle, and legacy. He recently produced a three-part series on COVID-19's impact on predominantly Black Albany, Georgia, and multiple film shorts on the current Black Lives Matter movement. His films have been reviewed by the Boston Globe, Atlanta Constitution, and Tampa Bay Times, and have been screened at multiple institutions, including Harvard and Dartmouth. He is a native of Albany, Georgia, and hails from a prominent civil rights family, where his grandfather, for whom he was named, was a buggy driver for Booker T. Washington at Tuskegee. Our next, next guest is Kiana Mickey a New York City-based leader and speaker that uses food as a driver of enterprise, innovation, and equity. For the past 10 years, she has worked on fostering a food-based solidarity economy in the New York region that increases farm viability, healthy food access, 
and leadership opportunities for small mid and mid-scale regional farmers, black and brown, mixed income, and other communities of color. She brings an equity-driven lens to her local, state, federal, and international policy work on issues such as food sovereignty, land tenure, and health equity. She has worked across the nonprofit and for-profit sectors to advise executive directors, boards, and other stakeholders on how to design and meet a mission rooted in racial, economic, and environmental equity, and recently transitioned out of her executive role, role at Just Food, and is currently consulting on multiple food enterprise projects, research on local food supply chains, and, ur and urban agricultural policy campaign. And now I will turn uh, the microphone over to Nadra Niddle, our uh, moderator. Thank you. I thank you all for joining us today for this topic that's been in the news headlines since the state lockdown started, um, that the African-American community, um, the Latinx community, and other communities of color have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And I tried to look into that by writing a piece about how the food system um, kind of has directly played a role in the types of comorbidities that um, African Americans in particular um, are vulnerable to and how that makes them vulnerable um, to this virus. But I wanted to hear from you all about, um, you know, some of the, the lessons or some of the findings that you all um, have learned um, as you advocate for communities of color. So I want to start um, with you, Dr. Altama Johnson. What would you say about you know, the specific reasons you think COVID-19 um, has wrought such havoc in black and brown communities? Okay, good, thanks. Um, thank you, Nadra, for this. Um, we've talked about this before a couple of months ago. Um, from my perspective, actually, you know, I'm, well, I, I'll say this, we live in a world, we live in a country where unfortunately, the color of our skin and economic standing determine what food that is available to certain groups, right? Um, to delve a little bit into that is when you think about the reasons that this happened, so first you look at obesity, diabetes, hypertension, that actually as a diet identified right, as um, commodities for mortalities for COVID-19 globally. But when you look at that, when you look at the US, you look at the black population, Latinx, as you mentioned, Native Americans, especially diabetes, they have higher rate of these chronic conditions. And all these conditions that we're talking about, they are food related disease conditions. And they're associated with poverty, you know, so you're thinking about unaffordable housing, low wages, poor access to care, poor access to healthy foods, and poor access to quality education. A little deeper, which uh, some of us may be familiar with, you look at the social de determinants of health as it relates to health inequalities. So you have disparities in the healthcare system, right? And so again, a lot of the population minorities, um, you know, we don't like the term minorities, but Blacks and Latinx and um, and uh, uh, Native Americans, they are underinsured, right? More likely to be underinsured. You have the hospitals that are in those communities that usually are don't have, um, they don't have enough access, right, to resources such as you know PPE equipment for protection, personnel for capacity that we're seeing right now with COVID, especially you know in, in New York. So, and then there is the aspect of unconscious racial bias that exists. I think at the beginning of this, we saw a lot of um, anecdotal reports that basically states that, you know, brown skin people were not being referred for to, um, test, test, testing as opposed to our other counterparts. So you have that, um, that, you know, that that in the back of our head. We, we, There's so many stories, I think, that came in the news that we heard about that. And then you have, you know, cultural beliefs in, you know, and misinformation. At the beginning of this, I, I don't know if all of us remember, but it was said that Blacks are not able to contract this, or, you know, this is not, you know, Black people don't, don't get this. Negative, we do. And, but that message, for some odd reason, it stick to a lot of the people within our community. And um, so when you have that, in addition to 
some of us having really a bad experience with the healthcare system as it is, we are not going to run when, when we're feeling bad to go to the doctors, right? And so there is that aspect of the healthcare system where you have those inequities that exist. And then you look at the low socioeconomic status to mention poverty. And we know poverty is directly related, associated with poor health outcomes. And so when we look at that, and then you look at uh, the percentage of Blacks that are actually low income and then have access to healthy foods, right? And, and, and as we talked, Nadra, a couple of um, months ago, talk about how some fast food chains are subsidized, right, for being in these communities. And we know fast food and junk food are associated with diabetes, high blood pressure, and so on. And so, and then there's the, the whole aspect of they live in more segregated neighborhoods, right? Where they lack resources such as banking, healthcare, full service, supermarkets. You know, where are they going to get whole foods from? Where are they going to, if they want something whole, something fresh, where are they going to get it from? Transportation to get to these places. Um, and you have crowding housing conditions, right? So you see the crisis, cases increasing, but if income is an issue, they leave below the income poverty line, then, you know, you have a lot of generation in one housing. So you, how are you able to follow the CDC recommendations of maintaining distance? You can't, right? So you're transmitting the whole family is getting infected. And then you have the whole idea that essential workers are blacks and brown bodies. A lot of us don't have the luxuries of working from home. We simply don't. We have to take public transportation, which usually are crowded, um, you know, to expose ourselves where we don't have Right? And you look at, you know, if we look at big factories and et cetera, they're not really providing their employees with the proper equipment to protect themselves and who are doing that usually are immigrants and minorities. Um, so, and then you have environmental toxins, the runoff and so on that we as brown bodies have been exposed to um, for years. So when really, when you think about why COVID has affected, um, black and brown bodies, you know, so ridiculously bad. It's just, honestly, the issues have been there. It just happened to be like a perfect thing. It just exploded in our face and, and we just have to deal with it. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. And President Adams, I know that you have been personally affected um, by type 2 diabetes and um, some of these other health concerns that have come up during the pandemic. And so I wanted to hear from you, President Adams, um, why you think black and brown communities have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And thank you so much for hosting uh, this uh, webinar. And I believe there are uh, many factors and um, one of the most important factors, which was just uh, mentioned, uh, we divided the city and the country into two groups. And the day that we shut down the city and the country, I told my staff, this is extremely problematic. We, div we indicated that New Yorkers and Americans were, certain groups were more important than others. We used the term essential and non-essential employees. And I knew that was coded language. Uh, it's clear we told essential employees uh, that they will go out. They couldn't shelter in place by the nature of their jobs. They could not uh, have social distance by the nature of their job. And, and in many cases, they stated you were not allowed to wear face masks or you would be brought up on departmental charges and they didn't supply them with the necessary PP, PPEs. Then we told non-essential employees, you can stay home, you can shelter in place, you can social distance and you can wear face covering. 70% of the people who were essential that were exposed were black and brown and women. That in itself was problematic. And then we told them, you cannot uh, get admitted to the hospital. We're not going to test you for uh, coronavirus. So you were going to expose your families. And we did this with the knowledge. There were certain knowns that we were aware of, as well as some of the unknowns. But here are the knowns we knew. We knew from the time coronavirus hit our land, we knew that if you had pre-existing condition, you had a more likelihood to have a devastating impact um, by it. We knew the number of uh, where those numbers were who had the pre-existing condition. And that's just a fancy term for things like diabetes, respiratory conditions, heart disease. And so if we would have just 
focus on those areas where those numbers were high, such as our nursing homes, uh, the NYCHA and public housings across America and the city. If we would have concentrated our efforts on those populations and if we would have given those essential employees their personal protection equipment, we would have had a major impact on the spread of coronavirus and the uh, level of treatment that was needed. And then the food supply. When I started doing an analysis of the food, we were feeding people who were senior or and living in economically challenging community. We were feeding their disease. And until we have a clear acknowledgement that the most important impact we could have on health in this country is to start examining the food that we as cities and states and federal government, that we are feeding people. We feed processed meat until we were able to reverse that here in New York City. We say we fight diabetes, yet we see 960,000 meals a day to our children that aggravate and in many cases causes diabetes. We have to change the conversation around health. It was a personal experience for me, and as you indicated, my 80-year-old mother who was diabetic for 15 years, seven years on insulin, and in two months after going to a whole food, plant-based, healthy diet, mom was off her insulin, and in three weeks, my vision came back from my diabetes diagnosis. My diabetes went in remission, my blood pressure normal, normalized, my cholesterol normalized, my ulcer went away, all with no medicine. <clears throat> Food is medicine, and that is what we need to start focusing on, the power of food and power of medicine. And that is why you saw such a large number of black and brown people who have poor diets, poor access to food, and not being allowed to have a healthy lifestyle. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that, and I'm so glad that your health has improved. Uh, Kiana, um, I wanted to speak with you as well, since most recently you were the executive director of Just Food. And so, you know, from that experience, why do you think um, black and brown communities have been hit so hard by the coronavirus? Uh, yes, um, I mean, I definitely echo um, what um, Borough President um, Adams and Daphne has already shared. And, you know, what I would just add to that is I think the short answer can be capitalism and the intersection of capitalism with systemic and persistent racism. Because what we saw was, you know, capitalism is this economic system that is holding us all, our society, our government, our work, our livelihood, and it prioritizes profit over people. That's how the system is built. And so it's then compounded by a system or systemic racism of inequity that doesn't value black, brown, or indigenous folks as human. And in fact, our bodies are just commodities. So when you put the lens of food, um, then you start to see the, you know, how food apartheid and health inequity and what are you know, li, you know, identified as comorbidities that are impacting those communities disproportionately are falling on the fault lines of existing systemic racism. And that looks like redlining of neighborhoods, economic disinvestment of our communities, you know, even weak infrastructure to support healthy food access um, and wealth creation within our communities. So again, kind of what um, other folks have been lifting, what we've been seeing, you know, what I've been seeing as a food systems leader is that COVID didn't create the <clears throat> troubles that we're facing. In fact, it's just really it being, it's exacerbating what was already persistent and, and, and an issue. And you know, just to also kind of touch on the concerns around like food, um, what we saw initially is um, in particular, and nationally, but in particular in the city and the state of New York, we saw that the priority became how to re-knit this capitalist system, how to support corporate ag and large supply, and then how to address what was their surplus and what was their bottleneck without necessarily thinking about or diverting or reallocating resources to local supply, regional supply. Um, we got deprioritized. Food justice work, food sovereignty work, healthy food education, all those kind of contracts and all that kind of work for, um, for a time stalled. And where a lot of the government funding and policies started to 
um, jump into was really to kind of support a channel of emergency food and resources. And I want to be clear that while I'm lifting up that is like a concern, emergency food and models like food banks, they are built to address emergency need. But as we see in our communities, food banks are not emergency anymore. These are so these are persistent, consistent charity-based models in our community that aren't really moving folks that are food insecure from being food insecure, food insecure to food secure. And they're not necessarily built or designed to support self-determination of community models like other grassroots and frontline groups are and local supply like farmers and producers. So what we saw was this um, over um, cons the, this reliance on resourcing emergency models when then there was a sudden influx of money that was then addressing surplus crops to get back into our communities, vulnerable communities, where they're now getting certain kind of foods, repurposing, say, school food, that some of it was not great and healthy. I think, you know, um, Daphne could probably speak to that even more so. Um, some of the food that I think um, Borough President Adams is, is lifting up in terms of processing, we started to hear that even food folks that were food insecure were now being um, continually addressed with our city and state resources to get supply of food that still was not healthy, that was still just exacerbating an existing issue. While and the, on the flip side, we had local suppliers, farmers, really questioning if they can and should, not that they're not growing, they were growing hyper-locally and in our region, but are they going to be able to come down to the city? Are there proven models like community-supported agriculture, community-run farmers markets, or even pop-up you know, connections, meal delivery? Were they were their food that has a home, healthy food? Was it was there going to be a place for it, a home for it, and there was there be a channel for it? And where is it going to be funding to really meet their food at the price and and fair price that farmers really deserve and producers deserve at a small to mid scale level? And I think while we figured, you know, the state and city figured out funds, millions of funds, dollars of funds to address emergency food, we're still at this place of struggling to identify how do under resourced organizations like Just Food, uh, other grassroots organizations, or small businesses, say like La Mirada in the Bronx, or other community-based um, restaurants, culinary industry, there's so many folks that are probably on this call that were impacted being back of the house or front of the house or restaurant workers or suppliers to those businesses. How do we still connect our food where we're able to meet a need, a diverse, culturally relevant need at a scale that makes sense for our communities that have been historically vulnerable? Um, and I think right now that while these these community driven solutions have been deprioritized, this is a window of change that we're seeing that we can kind of move around, um, beyond that. And I hope that that we continue to do that. Thank you, Kiana. And Clinton King, as, as a filmmaker, you bring a unique perspective to this issue. And I'd like to hear from you about how being an artist, um, how that's informed, uh, you know, your thoughts about why communities of color have been so hard hit by COVID-19. Thank you, Nadra, for having me and to the uh, James uh, Beard Foundation. I'm about a thousand miles away south of uh, New York City. Um, and to understand the virus's impact on Albany, Georgia, which ended up on the front page of the New York Times in late February, early March, when the uh, virus first hit, as being sort of an epicenter, certainly for the largest state east of the Mississippi, which was Georgia. And so the question was, you know, why did it happen? And so in large part to understand the impact and, and why this happened in some respects in this fairly remote town is to understand its history. Um, you know, uh, this town of Albany, Georgia came onto the sort of historic radar screen of African-American history, if you will, at the turn of the century. That's when a uh, young um, professor from Atlanta University by the name of William E.B. Du Bois went down there to study how black folk who were coming off of these plantations, this community is surrounded by old plantations, 
uh, they came into the center of commerce to make their way after uh, the end of slavery, after the war. And, uh, and so he called it the buckle of the black belt, the Egypt of the Confederacy. And so there was this mother load, if you will, of black folk concentrated uh, there. And it was there that in large part, he realized the need for further education, just needs generally for the, for the population. It's what gave birth to uh, a Joseph Hawley uh, starting what is now Albany State University. 60 years later, Dr. King would come there as the first major campaign after Montgomery, again, to help these uh, former enslaved or the heirs of these former enslaved Africans, uh, you know, realize their freedom in terms of voting rights. And so 60 years after that, then, of course, this virus hits and it hits like a bomb. Uh, in the epicenter, I think this was long before Atlanta became more of the pinnacle, Metro Atlanta became more of the pinnacle in terms of COVID deaths. Uh, this was the place where it all happened far early, early, early on. And that's why we ended up on the front page of the New York Times. And it's interesting to see where the, the addresses of those deaths happened. It happened in the neighborhood where in large part I grew up. It's about a two to five by five mile uh, sort of quadrant, if you will. And in that quadrant, at this point, there are no grocery stores at all. All you've got are dollar stores, corner stores, and drive throughs And so you've got these families that are serving themselves and serving their families, feeding their families in you know, the drive through line. Um, it, uh, today, even on the way uh, to this, this particular webinar, when I was going on my way here, uh, there was uh, five blocks worth of traffic backed up. For people driving their cars to a church to uh, get free food. Uh, because of the poverty here, because of the need here, um, you know, and so you compound that with, you know, the comorbidities that you've already talked about, uh, the diabetes, the hypertension, the asthma, on and on. And it became, in some respects, and it's a misnomer, but a perfect storm in terms of really becoming a problem for the people here. Now, you know, uh, a part of that is, you know, the need for, uh, uh, you know, intentional investment. Uh, by the white community back in there. But there's also an affirmative responsibility that we have as the black community uh, to invest in ourselves. And so uh, there's, there is a solid middle class here and there is wealth here, uh, but there's a lot of poverty too. And so, um, you know, we've got our job to do. We've got, we've got our job to do in terms of, of reinvestment. You compound that, of course, as well with poor healthcare here. Um, and you've got problems, but, um, but that's kind of the anecdotal snapshot of how we got to this place. Well, thank you, Clinton. And some of you have already touched on possible remedies to these problems, but I wanted to hear in more detail what you think are some of the policies and other interventions that we can use to stop food insecurity, and some of these other problems that have made black and brown people uh, so vulnerable to this virus. So President Adams, I'll start with you. What are some possible solutions here? Well, there, there are a few that I think is extremely important on some of the things we're doing here in the city. Uh, one, uh, we have the first of this kind um, program in Bellevue Hospital called Lifestyle Medicine. We partner with Dr. McMacken, and we have over 750 people on the rating list, waiting list, about 250 went through the program. And we're reversing diseases. We're showing people how to get off their medic medicine. We're showing them how, uh, what foods to eat in a very practical way. And then we need to really empower our faith-based institutions. Um, one of the most unhealthy locations for black folks is sitting inside our faith-based institutions. We need health ministries in every church. Uh, we need to be very practical and realistic in showing people how to eat healthy, uh, how to deal with their taste buds, and show them how to get the taste they're looking for, the power of different spices that we're doing here uh, in the, the city, and really showing people on a granular level that even if you walk into a, in a food desert, uh, to show how to go in the supermarket and shop 
uh, the power of buying dry beans and dry lentils to get your protein intake, how to make a vegan burger out of a, a dry lentils and mushrooms, and just showing people how they can cook healthy uh, as we continue this fight to have access to healthy food. And some of the things we're doing around um, hydro, um, hydroponic farming, uh, teaching our schools. I believe every school should have a rooftop garden where our children can learn how to grow food and serve it in their cafeteria. And these are some of the programs. We put over $100 million in our school uh, looking at the technology around this kind, kind of discussion. But we have to take this uh, into our own hands. This is an SOS month, a moment. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration, and each time we hand down these uh, food requirements, they are just wrong. And lastly, we have to change uh, our outlook on medicine. Um, our doctors, unfortunately, have been betrayed by our healthcare institutions to believe that we could continue to give uh, people medicine to only cover the symptoms of diseases and not dealing with underlying causes of diseases. Diabetes can be reversed. Uh, it's, it's the leading cause of blindness, leading cause of non-trauma limb amputation, uh, one of the leading causes of kidney failure. Kidney failure doesn't run in our community based on the DNA. It runs in our community based on the dinner. It's time for us to see the power of food and change how we think about health and medicine in a real way. Now, some of the things we're doing here in Brooklyn, and I'm excited about what we're rolling out, and I think it's going to have national implications. Thank you. And I know some people might be wondering about that type 2 diabetes being reversed. And I, I know I've seen some research that I think said within five years of diagnosis, if you can, if, if it's caught pretty early, that it is possible to make the lifestyle changes that can reverse that diagnosis, just in case anyone had some, some questions about that. And um, Dr. Altima Johnson, I'll, I'll go with you next in terms of what are some possible solutions here? Okay, I want to clear. I'm not doctor. I'm M MBS, you know. So I just want to say that I'm just that right. medical doctor. doctor. Okay, so it's good. Um, I want to highlight a couple of points that um, Eric Adams mentioned. Actually, one, what the first point he made actually when he said, if we focus our efforts on the populations, and then we can basically develop, you know, targeted community-based interventions for them. The issue that existed when COVID started was that we didn't have data. I'm a big proponent of data. If you don't have data, it's really difficult for you to identify the gaps that exist, correct? Um, so you can actually dump the resources that are needed to, you know, address the population that's most mm -hmm. in need. And so most immediately, I think now that the data is starting to come in, the quick and easy solution is to provide immediate access to those in need, right? The most vulnerable food. Um, as you, um, as Kiana said, you know, we, we're using emergency, you know, those food banks, that's not their role, but that's what they're doing right now because a lot of people are losing their job. They are going hungry. Um, and another thing, Eric, I was talking about that I can't honestly sit here and not plug it is uh, he's, he's focusing on plant-based eating, which is really when you look at the illnesses that were, you know, diabetes, hypertension, honestly, obesity, um, you know, had had blood had blood pressure. Actually, it's a, a, a risk factor for diabetes as well as, as heart disease. Um, you and he's talking and he mentioned going and plant based as which we fully support at the center and and we we are uh, the John Hopkins Center for a Livable Future. We do provide the technical advisory to the Meatless Monday program because we do believe in um, the fact that when you go, you know, in the data, not only do we believe that, but the data shows if you move towards um, more of a plant-based diet, right? You will decrease your risk of diabetes as well as heart disease and obesity. I mean, we, we, do, we do know that the data is pretty strong in that regard. So I'm glad he talks about, you know, he mentioned having incentive in place at the hospitals, at the schools. I know um, Adam, you know, Eric, you've done, you've institute programs in schools as well, you know, hospitals, you know, to get people eating better so we can, you know, decrease the prevalence of disease that exists. Um, but Again, the issue that we're talking about, though, though, is that we do know those foods are good for them, but the people that need them, they don't have access to them, right? I think um, Clinton mentioned that, you know, the communities, they have dollar stores, corner stores, and they are charging you a dollar and 25 cents for a banana. So you got to think about that, too, when you have right now, according to Pew, I believe, um, Pew Research, 
it shows, I think about, um, I forgot the statistic, but about 44% of black families, at least once, once one of them has lost their job. Um, so again, when we think about healthy food, access is, is gonna be an issue. So when we're thinking about policies, we have to address the poverty issue, right? We have to address the um, institute policies really that address poverty in America. Um, in addition to that, we have to empower. He talks about, you know, again, talking about Eric, we talk about empowering local communities, church faith, faith based organizations. I mean, the communities, um, you know, they're going to listen to people that look like them, which is actually why I changed my career actually tra trajectory to basically be in dietetics. Because you look at when you think about nutrition, when you think about eating, you know, uh, moving towards more plant-based diet. But if you if we saying that more Blacks and Latinx are, are the one with these issues, but if you look at the professionals that are doing this, dietitians, less than 3% of dietitians are Black. So when we're talking about education, we need to think about education at the higher level, providing funding um, to do that. So I think we have a lot of solutions we can talk about but unless until we really deal with the poverty issue and really empower our communities put money into the, the, our communities we are going to continue to have um this issue with pandemics or natural disasters i mean we've seen it with swine flu right we've seen it in new orleans with katrina again i'm saying it it's not new it is the system the system is doing exactly what it was intended to do right which is i think kiana mentioned which is oppressed brown skin and black bodies it is doing exactly what it's supposed to do that's what capitalism is you know that's what we're talking about but you know but if we think about it we have an amazing opportunity an amazing opportunity to actually put new things in place to change that system and i think we can do that but we have to be really more strategic um we have to be mindful but we have to invest in our communities it is necessary it truly is thank you and Kiana, I wanted to hear from you about possible remedies to some of these issues. And also, if you think the movement we're in right now, where we have the nation and, and really the world focused on Black Lives Matter, if you think that that provides an opportunity uh, for us, you know, to, to provide some interventions. Um, yeah, um, I think that, I think that this could be a window of change, but I think when we look at movements, we can have a pivot and we can have deep impact as long as we continue to galvanize each other, see ourselves as change agents, lift up our strengths, work through the things that are internalized oppression, other issues that get in the way of our own work between each other in order to really build solidarity and fight the larger systems that we're struggling with. And even if we can make big pivots and, and successes in this time, I think it's also important to kind of remind ourselves and listen to some of our elders in terms of movements and making sure that what we're working on is intersectional, what we're working on is really uh, deep and that it, while we can have changes in the immediate, um, we may not see the full transition of what we want um, in our lifetime. But that does not mean that we shouldn't do the work that we need to do now together in order to move that forward. Um, and so I do think this is a window of time. And I think a, some of it is within ourselves to figure out and determine how do we actually learn from past movements, learn from um, lessons learned, how do we connect back to our regenerative practices? Um, how do we build power with each other? And how do we infiltrate existing systems in order to make a change on the inside, as well as support our comrades and work that's going on the outside that really kind of shift? And um, I wanted to connect this to something that um, really speaks to me is this comes up in the connection around policy. And I've been really fortunate um, to do policy work you know, in my role at Just Food and internationally um, with different groups like Urgency and at the FAO level in civil society, um, the mechanism. But even as national and uh, hyper-local with some support through the HEAL Alliance and the School of Political Leadership. And we recently were um, not that much longer, like January, February, we're in Albany, Georgia. 
and it was my first time being there. And it was while I have met and have spoken and have been inspired by Mrs. Sherrod, Mrs. Shirley Sherrod, um, in the past, I've never been on the land of Resora. And it was really humbling for us. And we are a cohort here from Just Food, the Urban Ag and Equity team, um, working on a campaign around um, city and federal urban ag in the city. We partner and engage with teams from Buffalo and the DNA team from the Navajo Nation. And we didn't know it then, but it was really pressing it to be on black soil and black land at a time to hear from farmers, intergenerational farmers, elder farmers and young farmers, their active work around bringing healthy food um, to their community, the models that it takes, and also the continued struggle around resources to get healthy food to market, to get healthy food from other folks. So even somebody who's done so much policy work and have had so much impact on black farmers in Georgia and beyond, to hear that there's um, land and, and supporting and securing land tenure and how important that is to black and brown and indigenous folks in order to build the healthy food systems that we want and the businesses. And that connects to policy, but it also connects to funding and how do we support, and I think what um, Borough President Adams and Daphne and Clennon had mentioned as well, is there the self reinvestment in our own work? Are we building a solidarity economy that's rooted in cooperation, equity, and food? Are we funding value change where we're bringing in small to mid-scale farmers and producers? Are we supporting enterprise? Because we can, we can have folks that grow food, but if they're not able to build value added products. If they're not able to get that food from the farm to your table, to a model that you're able to afford it um, and, and it be accessible um, and, you know, and build enterprise around that, then we'll never have the multiplier effect that we really want to have and see and, and be able to make the choices that we want around the food that we decide to grow, the food that we decide to sell and, the, the, and how we use food as a, revolution, a revolutionary tool. Um, so I do think that there are opportunities to build um, equitable and comprehensive food and farm policy on the federal, state, and city level. I think we can continue to find ways to connect our frontline partners with policy um, groups and advocacy groups that work on policy to really build the changes that we want to see in our infrastructure and in the work that we're doing. And um, we want, we need to continue for all of us to feel um, a little bit closer and a little bit more active in that work. So these, these kind of bills get implemented, whether they're federal policies like the farm bill and programs that get funded like the urban ag bill, that's, um, there's a grant due next month, value added projects, programs that support socially disadvantaged or as the USDA calls black and brown indigenous folks uh, socially disadvantaged, local food. I think what has really lifted up and I continue to hope folks see on the policy level as well as community driven solutions is how important it is to strengthen the local supply chain, our value chain of food and who's in that value chain, not just growing the food, but how it's getting to our communities. I think on the city level, there's, um, there's uh, policies like the Good Food Purchasing Program that um, is moving forward in New York. It's already been implemented in other cities that have con that should continue to push and advocate for concrete demands that find ramps and runways um, and pushing the city to create better contracts that enable small to mid-scale farmers to be able to connect to contracts. These contracts will give them the resources to scale up and to scale up with intention and in a scale up with the healthy food that we want. We need to continue to find ways to support policies like the urban ag bill and how they intersect in our community where we are supporting the spectrum of urban ag um, where whether it is on rooftops or whether it's in the soil, making sure that hyper-local folks that are growing and have been growing, even when communities have been divested from, do not get lost in bills or practices or lose out on resources because they don't own the land that they're working on. So much of the land in the city that That's folks separate. are able to grow are mm -hmm. not um, able to be owned. And while there's some land that can be converted and it's, there's some land that is in community trust like the Brooklyn um, Queens Community Land Trust, there is many other land that is under parks per, um, provisions that there are 
some guidelines that can limit or be barriers to um, building enterprise or helping those folks learn how to scale up to enterprise and production. These are the ways that kind of get in the way of folks going from hyper local to regional, making those connections in their community. I would say too, when there's work around um, uh, building and supporting resources to groups that are already on the ground doing this work to help fund, whether it is zoner approach models that are bringing cultural remnant meals to homebound communities, whether it's community-based food hubs that we need to build the hub and spoke models of grilling facilities that can handle cold and dry storage. We're not going to be able to feed folks if we're not able to get this fresh food to folks and extend the life or get it to folks faster. We're not not going to be able to feed folks if the price is going to be so high for farmers to grow healthy food to be environmental stewards on the land at a cost that will will never compare to large and corporate ag we're never going to be able to get the food in our communities or make the changes that we want or even you know to um borough president adam's point of using food as medicine unless we start hitting these multiple levers from the city from the state to the federal from the community, from profit to nonprofit, and really build a collective power and a solidary economy that is really rooted in regenerative practices, cultural relevancy, and um, resilient cities. And I think New York, so much like some of the other cities that we can look out to, could be that. And I think one of those big steps is truly supporting and resourcing organizations on the ground that do this work already supporting local farmers and building policies with them in mind in order to make it feasible and realistic and tangible for our community to connect to. Thank you, Kiana. And Clinton, um, same question for you, but through this Black Lives Matter lens that we're in now, obviously a disproportionate amount of Black people uh, and brown people are killed by police. But how do we get the public to take these diseases, you know, type two diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and some of the, the food insecurity that causes these illnesses to thrive? How do we get communities, um, not just communities of color, but the American public in general to take these diseases that are killing us just as seriously as police violence. Again, I mean, what I have to say in large part is anecdotal, but I do think that it has a sort of nat national um, implication, I mean, national re reflection. Um, what I will say is that in this community, it's unusual in the sense, as I, as I may have shared with you before, this is a predominantly black community. It's more than 70% black, and yet ironically, for the last uh, four administrations or two administrations, there have been black folk at the helm. I'm talking about the mayor and the city council or the city commission as it were. And as it turns out, this community sat on its hands during the last election where policies are made that definitely directly affect them, uh, including in terms of this pandemic that we're going through. And they allowed not only for there to be uh, a white mayor uh, when they could have, and this this was the whole point of the Albany movement back in 1961 and 62 uh, in terms of self-determination. Uh, they basically, uh, they allowed a, a, a white man to basically be elected. A white man who this week says that that black lives don't matter. All lives matter instead was his response. And there was total outrage. My point to you is, is in large part, much of our pain in this life I believe, is self-chosen. And so there's some self-ownership that we've got to have, recognizing that the ruby slippers at the end of the day are on our feet, and it's up to us to click our heels together to start dealing with some of the change that we, we need to deal with. And so, you know, I was very pleased to hear uh, from one of the city, uh, one of the two city council people here. Um, uh, before I leave that point, my point is it's really important for us to vote. And we didn't do that this last election at all. We just didn't do it. And so this pretty uh, uh, black town now has a, is basically being ruled by a, a white majority, a, a white minority. And that only happened because we allowed it to happen. You know, that, that, we allowed that to happen. Uh, 
one of the things that I did hear uh, on the on the plus side was that there is a uh, husband and wife couple who um, have put together a sort of school retrofitted school bus where they're going into the black community and bringing fresh vegetables, a community in large part that is so dependent on public transportation to bring that food into the community. And my point is, is that we've got to continue to do more of that, more uh, owning the problem ourselves and dealing uh, you know, with, with that problem ourselves in creative ways as they are. Um, but at the same time, also uh, demanding those uh, entities upon our tax dollars to do a better job in terms of serving us. In the case of the hospital here, uh, you know, so many of these people died there and, and, and they were feeling very distrustful for all kinds of reasons, not the least of which is that they look like at a, uh, a Tuskegee model and they're just distrustful of the, of the healthcare system. Uh, plus this, this particular um, hospital was in large part really outgunned in terms of what they needed to take care of this majority, uh, majority black community. And so, um, so those demands have to be done on uh, certainly of tax supported institutions like hospitals, you know, uh, yes, we have to go ahead and we've, we've got to uh, uh, participate in the, in the political process in a way that is not happening down here as it should. And then the other thing is we've got to, you know, employ creative sort of approaches, if you will, uh, entrepreneurial speaking, uh, to serving our own community. Thank you. And we're getting close to the end here, but um, Eric Adams, I wanted to circle back to you um, in terms of possible policy solutions. And one reason I'm looking at policy is because in the article I wrote, um, I, there was one part where I concentrated on Los Angeles, where I live, and the LA City Council, for example, they've tried to limit the number of fast food restaurants um, in South LA, which is mostly people of color. However, um, that legislation still didn't stop the number of corner stores and convenience star stores from popping up. So there's still, there wasn't a proactive movement to get grocery stores in those communities. So they limited the fast food restaurants, but they did not expand the number of grocery stores. And I was wondering, obviously you're in New York, but I was just wondering um, if you could talk about things that legislators in cities can do to try to combat food insecurity. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first, uh, I want to give my my email uh, for whoever is a listener and they want to uh, go through the same experience that my mother and I and uh, thousands of others who have got the information. It's ask, ask Eric uh, at brooklynbp.nyc.gov. And I just put my the information in a small little email that people can read, and they can take this experience um, for themselves to reverse uh, the their diseases and live a healthy lifestyle. Uh, the second, uh, as I said, this is an SOS moment. This is a save ourselves moment, and we need a short term, mid term, and long term. We cannot afford to wait until government turns around and identifies the seriousness of this problem. There are things that we must do now while we got a few while we're flying. And there are things we need to do on the ground now, like support those organizations that are on the ground and make sure they get the proper funding and resources. But there are really some things we could do right now as we uh, move to a midterm and a long-term plan. Some of the legislation that's crucial uh, that we're pushing through here. Uh, banding, uh, we were successful in banning processed meat in our schools. Type one, one carcinogen, the same as smoking cigarettes. Uh, we're now banning that. We're doing a 50% beef reduction purchase here. We're making sure every tax dollar now that's purchased to go to the food pantries, the city harvest, uh, and the other food delivery services. If it's our tax dollars, it must be healthy. No more giving people corn chips and pop, pop jacks and other foods that is making them sick. We're saying if it's our dollar, you are going to buy healthy food. I want my young men who are incarcerated to be fed healthy food, my seniors healthy food, my schools healthy food, my senior centers healthy food. We need to look at our dime. I can't tell people what to eat in their homes. 
But darn it, if I'm using my tax dollars, I'm not feeding the healthcare crisis by allowing you to eat food that is going to destroy your body. And we're looking at legislation to do so on the state and city level. And lastly, I commit you to this. In 2021, when I'm the mayor, this is gonna be the healthy city in America because we're gonna make sure black and brown people have good healthy food and they can thrive and grow. All right, thank you. And we have about a minute and a half left. Does anyone want to make a point in about 60 <laughs> seconds? Okay, Daphne. I'll end with something. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Eric, you are speaking. You are preaching to me right now. You are making me excited. You are like providing, you know, access to healthy food, plant-based food. Um, you know, th this is how we do it, right? It's we have to take care of our community. So I, I like that. But I do want to make a point. Um, that we, the long-term impacts of COVID that really probably didn't we really think about is that right now, the data is showing that at least, you know, keep in mind a lot of our kids are not going, they're not in school, right? A lot of them are learning remotely. Um, a lot of them are not able to, you, right now, they have to give up one meal a day, right? Because a lot of, we, we you know, with our national school lunch program, et cetera, we fed a lot of kids. Um, there's a lot of trauma going on in the world, and that actually has a lot of internal stress. There are a lot of hormones that are being released, and, and a lot of, you know, insomnia, etc. Um, so you have people suffering from ha hunger. You have a lot of children that did not have access to this remote learning, right? right. This is long-term implication of COVID that we're not thinking about. And, and I, I am concerned um, for this generation that is actually going to move forward, really, that we've lost because... I mean, we, you know, they've lost about four or five months of education. They are going without food. Um, we don't know how long this is going to last, right? We can't really predict from a food security, you know, aspect what really what the long-term impacts are going to be. But we do know what's going on now. And if we really don't sit down to take this as an opportunity um, to change, you know, how we see um, our people, how we see brown bodies, and how we feed our brown bodies and we have to empower each other i think there's a power i think kiana said this eric said this on this yeah. we have to empower um our communities it is within us we do have the power when i see you know when i hear people say rest in power i'm thinking do we really know how much power do we have and mm -hmm. i think um you know that must be a focus and we must remember to have long-term impacts and we have to work on um, alleviating some of these issues. And food is medicine, and I do believe that. Um, so I'll stop there. Oh, well, yeah, I would like to add just well, something really quick. I think to both your points, I do think there are there's an intersection of inequity and there is also the opportunity to leverage power. I think that there are existing models that are trying to do work that are connecting food to medicine, to healing, to practice, to folks that maybe are homebound and can't get it. And I think there's a way to bring healthy food to folks that is grown in our communities grown in our in, in our rural areas that can be turned into um, culturally relevant and appropriate meals at scale in our communities by community chefs and other um, culinary folks that are out of um, out of work and that those could be job opportunities for youth and out of work folks to get that last mile to folks and I think if we really hear and believe that and I totally believe in you uh, uh, Burr President Adams, in terms of like healthy food and meals, whether it's whole foods where folks are able to culturally relevant seasonal food that they're able to cook themselves in the ways that they know that their ancestors do. Um, if there's meals that we know that folks have that hold those recipes and knowledge can create those meals for folks that can't cook, if we put resources in our city and state right now to models at scale in our community, we can see the change that you want to see in 2021 right now. And I have some ideas for you. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for taking the time to participate in this webinar. And thank you, um, everyone out there who took the time to listen in. Thank you. Take care, ladies. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you, Glennon. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And the James Beard Foundation would like to thank um, Kiana, Nadra, Daphne, Eric, 
and Clennon for your participation today. Um, you know, there's been a lot of really great feedback. Um, certainly we will be interested in um, following up um, if you are available. Thank you, um, Borough President, for your email. Um, if you have further questions, please feel free to um, visit uh, Impact, um, our industry support webinars online, and also email impact at jamesbeard.org. Uh, and also, if you have questions, feel free to email us. Um, and we encourage you to visit our website for more opportunities to participate and interact. Um, and thank you all again for your time and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nadra. <laughs> Daphne, thank you so much. It was a uh, to be connected to you. I am yeah, planning to stay in touch. <laughs> yes, same, same. I'm already like trying to think about it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Uh, wait, how do I get out? I don't know how to get out. <laughs> There's probably a button somewhere that says leave. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm.